Okay, I'm going to get started, guys, whether you're here or not. So, I've been introduced enough today, so I ain't going to bore you with it. Um, I am John Manning, and I'm, I'm an incurable geo junkie. So, uh, you know, enjoy what I got to say, hopefully. But I, I do want to apologize. I know many of you are engineers. And I have uh, failed the Dale Carnegie School of How to Win Friends and Influence People in the Engineering World. <laughs> and it, it frustrates me over the years. I've, I've worked with literally hundreds of engineers. And by and large, they are so stuck in a certain paradigm. And it is so refreshing to find an engineer that simply says, I'm here to learn, tell me what you've done and where I can do better. And I've had some incredibly positive experiences. One in uh, Bard College, the new science building. The engineer was uh, uh, Gary James from, who's he with, the British outfit. Uh, he's there right now. Come on, Brad, you know the British player. British. I, no? Oh, God, it escapes me. But we were at a meeting at Bard, and we're all discussing amongst the entire team about uh, geothermal nuances for that science building. It's a very demanding load. And Gary had already put together his schematic design, doing it with conventional stuff. And, of course, you know, I do my normal rude uh, behavior in meetings like that and sort of tell it like I see it. But then Gary came up to me after the meeting and said, you got some time? And he pulled me in a separate private room, and we sat and talked for two hours. The guy just wanted more information. And, and I applaud engineers who do not have that uh, defense mechanism kick in as soon as you uh, point to what they know. So what's wrong with this picture? Can be a candid discussion of, of what I've seen in drawings, pictures, dozens and dozens and dozens of engineering projects that have gone out to the street that just highlight nothing more than the inexperience in the design team. This one, it's going to, kind of hard to see, I'm sure. But the question is simply, what's wrong with this picture? Who, who knows what it is? The reverse return manifold for 17 boards, this was a real project. If I blow it up and take a chunk out of the middle, you can see one interesting aspect. We got three inch pipe going all the way through the entire length of the header. Simple little detail. But what it does is undermine your credibility. This is a fundamentally non-workable design. It's not just an, you know, a personal preference. It's bad engineering. Loops are 495 feet with inch and a quarter pipe down the borehole. So it gives you a sense of um, the nature and the size of the loop field. There was many, many groups of these 17. So it was a very large project. Um, and let's just talk about it. To calculate a flow rate that corresponds to a velocity of two feet per second. What's so magic about two feet per second? Perch. We got to get the air out of these systems. And air bubbles only get really motivated to some degree if we can get up to two feet per second. So that is the line in the sand that the industry has adopted. And I'll tell you, it's just the line in the sand. If you can get three feet per second, go for it. You get the air out that much faster. So we're trying to reach two feet per second. You simply need to look at the cross-sectional area of the pipe and the desired velocity. The tricky part is keeping track of all the units and the conversion factors. Obviously, engineers should not have a problem doing that. The basic formula, flow rate equals area times velocity. 
Um, and if we want to get our two feet per second and we know the cross-sectional area of the pipe, we can then calculate the flow rate or area. If I have to tell you this, you're in the wrong class. Um, okay, so we look at different pipe sizes. And for an inch and a quarter pipe down the borehole, we got the area. And this is the inside diameter of those various size pipes. So you need information like that. Formula for the flow rate, and you gotta, you gotta be careful of conversions and whether you're talking feet of head or PSI or, you know, what, you know, gallons, uh, translating cubic feet into gallons, all these little nuances that Hopefully you guys have mastered. But from this data, we can now calculate the required flow rate for any given pipe size. There are charts out there that will give you this in a cheat sheet. But frankly, I think you ought to be capable of just calculating it. Doesn't take long. If you were to decide to go with DR17 pipe, what happened? The ID of DR17 relative to DR11, larger. Indeed, the wall is thinner. And when you get up to the three and the four and the six inch pipes, the eight inch pipes, DR17 is more than robust enough. So you gotta look at the, the wall thickness and the cross-sectional area for those. If I look at my little piece of three inch pipe in this header, the very last section of three inch, I have to have a flow rate out there of 683 GPM. Not good. Why there? I, I'm just saying I'm looking at what I feel to be the worst place in the system, which is that three inch header out at the end where I've already dumped 16 circuits of flow so now I got to have enough flow in that last section. So we'll walk through this a little bit. It may be possible to get a pump that can deliver the required 683 GPM, but like all pump selections, we will need to know the pressure drop that the piping system will experience at that flow rate. So now you start looking at all the pieces of the puzzle. You got our loops, inch and a quarter loops, 495 feet deep. So you get roughly a thousand feet of inch and a quarter pipe. Each loop has to achieve a, a, a flow rate of 40.2 GPM. Calculating pressure drop can be tedious uh, unless, unless you utilize tables that provide pressure drop for 100 feet of pipe. Typically these are just about anywhere you can look um, on the web in your you know, mechanics manual, whatever you want to do, but you got to calculate it. So do not get discouraged if you cannot find a table that provides the exact flow rate you are looking for. You can adjust pressure drop by multiplying by the square of the flow rate. Basic formula, engineers need to have this embedded in their head if they're going to deal with geothermal. It applies to everything. So we, uh, we, we calculate our pressure drop at those flow rates that we need to have. I got too many words in this slide. There's a particular website I found, which was great, um, which helps you uh, do the math and come up with numbers. The pressure drop through that inch and a quarter loop, when we get all done crunching the numbers, 20.8 feet ahead through the loop, at 40.2 GPM, not a big deal. But let's look at our header. And if we've got each section, the flow rate through the first section is certainly the total flow rate. As you go through and start spilling off the flow rate to all the different parallel circuits, indeed, the flow rate through the last three-inch section um, is one-seventeenth of the total flow of the system. The flow rate for these sections, 
So I worked my way back to 643 GPM, which is the number I highlighted earlier. The next step is determine and adjust accordingly a reference pressure drop for three inch. And you go through section by section, adding up the pressure drop. And with a table like this, you can get there. And I won't bore you with all the detail, but you calculate a pressure drop for every section of pipe, and then you add them up. So now I have 258.7 feet of head for both headers. I got a supply header and I got a return header. Now I got to look at the pipes going to and from the building. Three inch, this particular job had 540 feet of three inch pipe. And I go through some similar number crunching at 683 GPM. And for that 540 feet of supply and return pipe, I got a pressure drop of 673 feet. So now I add them all up. 1141 feet of head at, or, or translates to 488 PSI. Would you want to do it? <laughs> we, we estimated that it would take two fire trucks to do it. Neither, are, neither is our polyethylene pipe in the ground. So it's just a design that is lacking. Actually, with enough uh, insulting emails that I sent to various people in the food chain, I, I got them to change the design. But it, they stonewalled me. They didn't want to hear from me, which is fine. It's their choice. But my God, don't design a geothermal system that is going to undermine the market. Bad systems cannot be tolerated. If you could, would you want to? And I talk about the pressure and the piping and uh, can a fire truck do it? Uh, no, you can't do it, bottom line. If that isn't bad enough, there's a little note here on the detail. It says three GPM. Any reaction to that? I got a 495 foot loop and the engineer has called out a flow rate of three GPM. It's absurd. I, it's just crazy. Might be a typographical error, might have been GPM per ton, but it doesn't matter. I need a flow rate for that loop. So, and then I of course call it out here, did you notice this? And I'll tell you, there's drillers out there, contractors, who look at these engineering documents and see little notes like that. And they lose faith on every aspect of the design at that point. The owner gets involved when the driller speaks up and says, this is garbage, I'm not going to install it like this. And suddenly the engineer's caught in a hot seat trying to defend himself. Let's ponder this. 3 GPM flow rate for a 495 foot bore. Does this mean we need 495 feet per ton? Or maybe we are choosing to operate the loop field at 0.75 GPM per ton. Nominal size, 150 feet per ton will get you in the ballpark for just about any job in the Northeast, plus or minus 50 feet because you got to do your homework. Or maybe the engineer just makes this guy look like a genius. These are the little things that can make a huge difference. Implications. Oh, did I mention Reynolds' number? If indeed you're only going to pump three GPM through an inch and a quarter pipe. With propylene glycol, the Reynolds number is 1140. Is that acceptable? There is this arbitrary line in the sand that the industry's drawn. We're on a Reynolds number of 2500. But again, I would say, if you know fluid mechanics, you know the transition from laminar to turbulent occurs somewhere between 2,000 and 4,000. 
what what kind of piping would be closer to 4,000? Long, smooth surface, straight pipe. Guess what we got? Long, smooth, straight pipe. So an arbitrary Reynolds number of 2,500 is sort of like this line in the sand. You need to push Reynolds numbers up to get good heat transfer. But you also got to be careful not to push pressure drop to an extreme. So it's a balancing act between Reynolds numbers and pressure drop. If you dial down your propylene glycol, that gets better. We're getting up to 2377, 12% methanol, 2349, and water only, 4520. Now the good news, at 495 feet per ton, they don't need antifreeze. I, I would stamp that job a Lloyd Hamilton job. <laughs> I, I, I applaud trying to get by without antifreeze. It's unfortunately, I think, to be cost effective for most jobs, it's a necessary evil. Implications, some additional info. It's a typical academic building, 100,000 square feet. Uh, the load was somewhere in the 300 ton ballpark. And guess what? There were 284 loops in the loop field. So indeed, it was sized at 495 feet per ton. Ridiculous. Perhaps the engineer actually believes the one loop per ton, which unfortunately for decades in our industry has been preached by a lot of the people in my position. We go out and do training. And a lot of the training came from Oklahoma State University. And indeed, in Oklahoma, they grew up with loops being 150 feet deep, 200 feet deep. It was mud drilling. They were not incentivized to go deeper. So they simply developed this cliche almost, oh, one loop per ton. But in the Northeast, due to the difficulty of drilling, we generally want to go deeper. We only want to wrestle with the overburden a minimal amount of time and go at least 495 deep, foot deep in most formations. But then you start to an inch and a quarter, 495 feet, and if I'm truly sizing it properly, I probably got flow rates of 10 to 12 GPM, which now my pressure drop gets ugly. So what we've done, and certainly a lot here at Skidmore, once we cross that 400 foot line in the sand again, we stepped it up to inch and a half loops. And a lot of the loops at Skidmore and the more recent uh, vintage of loop fields has been inch and a half. Uh, perhaps the engineer actually blah, blah, blah. Implications, more. I can only conclude that the engineer failed to fulfill their responsibility to their client. And I'm sorry if I sound offensive, but after doing this stuff for so long and to see it poorly designed is an insult. There are resources out there, guys like Ed, and I certainly don't hesitate to share my information and my scar tissue. I certainly wasn't born with all this knowledge, but you do it enough and you learn it. And what happened on this particular job, the loop field turned out to be 3.1 million when a properly sized loop field could have been done for a million dollars. And geothermal is what's labeled as being too expensive. I'm tired of hearing that. The good news, the engineer admitted his mistake, changed the reducing manifold design, and he called out a sufficient amount of two and a half inch pipe. What's wrong with that? Hey. And yet, I've got letterhead from an engineering firm telling me that a certain pipe manufacturer would make two and a half inch pipe. They went out of their way to, the, to defend their design. And I said, well, give me the same letter that identifies all the fittings I need to interface with two and a half inch pipe. That's what really doesn't exist. Any pipe extruder will throw a two and a half inch die in their extrusion machine and make you all the pipe you want. 
But if you can't put it together in the field, no good. So, so. <laughs> okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit. What's the difference between an egg and an elephant? You remember that old joke? The old joke goes, as a kid, I remember hearing this. What's the difference between an egg and an elephant? Well, I don't know. Well, I'm not going to send you to the grocery store to buy eggs. Come home with an elephant. So, my question is, what's the difference between a short loop, which, of course, we all know is ridiculous. We don't want to have short loops. And not sizing pipe for efficiency. Here you're asking your client to spend tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars on a loop field, not because he wants to put the name geothermal on the system. He's investing that money for efficiency. If you don't know, in addition to not shopping for eggs, I would not want you designing my geothermal system. They both shortchange your customer. They cheat your customer. If you can try to justify undersized pipes by old rules of thumb like, oh, four feet per hundred, that's how I size pipes, you're in the wrong business. Look at the system performance. CV. Who knows what a CV is? I knew I could count on Sam. But it is amazing how few people really understand it and how to use it. Flow rate, DPM, at which the pressure drop is indeed 1 PSI. It is a mechanism that is used quite often on valves to rate the valve. But I would suggest every part of your system has a CV. And you can use it to quickly analyze and develop quick and dirty spreadsheets to come up with pressure drops and what does the effect of stepping up a certain pipe size do for you. So indeed, you, another handy tool for engineers. Indeed, you could plot it this way. I got PSI on the left, one PSI, and 100% of the CV is always going to fall in that dot. Now, what happens if we double the flow? It's a squared function, so now the pressure drop quadruples. So instead of one PSI, we now got four PSI. What happens if we reduce our flow rate to half? Well, it gets cut by a factor of four. So now we're looking at a 0.25 PSI, less than a foot ahead. And I would suggest that this curve, where you want to be for most elements in a system, is what I call this sweet spot. Keep it below the CV, somewhere down in that uh, half, you know, quarter to three quarters of your CV rating. That's designing for efficiency. How do you size your pipe? Oh, this one, this one will get some of you. I just know what size to use. Oh my God, I could ask a plumber, what size pipe should that be? Well, two inch. You just don't. Is he right? Maybe, maybe not. How about inventory? You know, I got a shop full of pipe. Maybe I just need to size it based on inventory. Flow capacity. Every size is good for a certain flow rate. Might run into that a whole lot of times. How about seven feet per second velocity limit? And that is often a good number to use with brass and copper, but you don't want to have sustained flow rates higher than that. Yeah, occasionally you can bump up above it, but you start to enter an area called erosion. You've got dirt and crud in your system. It can wear away a copper fitting or a brass fitting in, in a lot shorter period of time than you'd like to see it. Four feet per hundred. 
It's classic. But I challenge you to rethink that. And then, of course, I know everything. And I hate to be so obnoxious and rude, but no, frankly, I enjoy it. Um, how much does pipe matter in, in the, how much is, where the heck is that word behind my little thing? Is it? Pipe material, very good, yeah. How much does pipe material really affect pressure drop? We've got oodles of choices. Certainly anything outdoors, I would only use HDPE. Whether you stick with DR11 or DR15.5 or DR17, those are choices you can make to help cost reduce and still be safe. 13.5, uh, we got copper, all the different types of copper. We got PVC, we got PEC, and one of my favorites is rubber hoses. Here's a table that'll uh, make you scratch your head and say, oh boy, that's a bunch of numbers. What does it mean? And I simply color code it to say, relative to DR11, HDPE, just about everything, certainly in the smaller sizes, I only look at three quarter through two inch, and you can certainly do the same analysis as you get better, bigger, but they're generally either all IPS or very close to the same diameters. Down here in these smaller sizes, you know, PEX tubing, copper is all done with CTS standard. So the same nominal size is actually much smaller in diameter. So if you simply stick with a certain nominal size, yeah, if you go to thinner wall polyethylene, I gain 3% in terms of, uh, Oh, the inside diameter change. That's all I'm reflecting here is how much did the inside diameter change? And then, what is the impact on the CV? You have a certain length of pipe, it's going to have a certain pressure drop. Whatever flow rate creates a one PSI drop, that's your CV. So now my little 3% increase in inside diameter, I got 9% more call it flow capacity. Whereas I go into PEX tubing, my God, I got half the flow capacity. Different pipe sizing standard can significantly affect your job. Push it further, pressure drop. So I've reduced pressure drop by 8% with my thinner wall polyethylene, but if I go to PEX tubing, I double my pressure drop. So again, I caution you, understand what's going to be used, what you want to specify on a job, and I strongly encourage the looking at HDPE for indoor piping or this new pipe that's out there trying to penetrate the market, uh, Aquatherm. It's kind of a unique pipe. It's, it's all over the world, but the United States can't really seem to embrace it. Um, doesn't need as many pipe hangers as HDPE. I, I'm just surprised we are continuing to use steel. It just amazes me. Um, I'm so proud of you, Lloyd. <laughs> True. Pipe sizing for geothermal. Don't cheat your customer. Design for efficiency. Geothermal deserves this. The people who are spending the money to buy geothermal are buying efficient. Therefore, sizing pipe is critical. Based on length and material, a diameter can be selected to maximize efficiency. Okay, what's the next little subject I got uh, for typical water to air application? How much could the seasonal COP improve by designing the piping so that a single pump could be used? And a lot of you guys, engineers, may not be familiar with the residential world, but this is a typical residential challenge. And I don't know if those who heard Jens earlier, he hasn't installed a two-pump flow center in about two years. He sizes his pipe to allow him to use a single Grundfos 2699 on as big as a five-ton heat pump. So, but what's it worth? Why would you want to buy extra-sized pipe? 
to avoid that second pump. Looking at some numbers, average COP of heat pump only. We got full load and part load as a dual capacity compressor. We got average capacities. We can then look at how many hours a year, annual hours of runtime at these two different speeds. I got 700 hours a year at full capacity, maybe 1,800 at part load. I got 2,500 hours of runtime. So the total BTUs delivered in each one of those modes, we have to add that up. And then we take our kilowatt hours based on these COPs, and bingo, I got 4,568 kilowatt hours to deliver 64 million BTUs in a heating season. So heat pump only COP, 4.12, good little heat pump. Kilowatt hours for two pumps, 440 watts. Can be anywhere from 400 to 440 for a Grundfos 2699. That alone is 1100 watts or kilowatt hours in a year. So I now calculate my system COP. I throw my two pumps into the mix. I've dropped from somewhere between 375, 4.33, call it 4.2. I've now dropped to 3.3. .3. And people will justify, well, inch and a quarter pipe is what I normally see, so that's why I called it out. And if you can simply say inch and a half, two inch, and suddenly the two pump, one of them goes away. And I've, I've regained roughly 0.36 in a COP, which is close to 10%, 10.7%. System performance difference just by picking pipe a little differently. Thank you. Contact us. Phoenix Energy Supply, blah, 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 blah. You guys know how to find me. And uh, I think the cash bar is waiting. But any questions, comments? I can't see you well, so just shout it out. My contact info? Maximum temperature for HDPE. Uh, polyethylene is generally listed at 120 degrees upper end with intermittent duty up to 140. So if you're going to do the load side of a hydronic system, I wouldn't recommend HDPE, although we have done it. You've got to be in total charge of that distribution system. If I got high mass radiant and I can run the entire year at 95 degrees and I got enough safety factors so that if the pump dies, the heat pump might overheat briefly, but it'll probably trip off before it reaches 120 because there's no flow. So 120 nominally, 140 intermittent duty. And next time, Todd, show up on time. What else we got? Well, if you look at every aspect in your system, the piping, um, even the valves, ball valves, um, you want to select them so that you're not pushing them up to the CD and beyond. So, right. And, and You've opened the door for another brief discussion on the use of balance valves on a loop field manifold. 
I'm here to tell you, it's not worth the money. There are balance valves on some of the loop fields here at Skidmore. Every time I've looked at them, they are in a full wide open position, imposing about a two PSI pressure drop for the life of the system. And any balance valve will tell you point blank, they're only accurate to, at best 5%. And if you can't design a loop field that is within 5%, and even if you had to go to 10% flow imbalance in your loop field, I guarantee you'll never see the performance difference. So why are we seeing balance valves on loop field manifolds? That's what I sense too. There's this del del delusion of precision. And if you really understand how a loop field works, I don't care if you got six DPM in a loop or eight or nine. It's about the temperature gradient between the bulk of that loop field and the earth. And whether it's a six GPM or nine GPM, frankly, you're not gonna see the difference because you're only changing the heat transfer coefficient in a very minuscule amount. The big resistance to heat transfer is the grout and the dirt on the outside. So whatever you do to think you're improving the system by adding balance valves, it is a total waste of money up front. It's a waste of money in operating costs that go on forever. So thank you for opening that door for me. I didn't get off my soapbox again, but. <laughs> um, indeed, and, and, and the interesting thing, you know, I get on the phone with Ed and others in the industry that I've known for years, and we just shake our heads every time we see a loop field manifold with balance valves. I swear it was designed by the Bell vendor. Other questions, comments, tomatoes, anything? I think it's a very interesting approach. I get a little concerned because I've calculated pressure drops and, and some of the questions you asked earlier I'm more concerned about laminar flow when you get the shorter loop. Start breaking it up into four circuits, and there's a certain depth where I think it does some good. Whether or not it saves you money, I don't know. Um, I haven't. It's certainly got a little more bulk to it. Um, no, I think what a green ability is, it has done is really try to push the envelope to see from a, from a fabrication standpoint, from enhanced surface area in the ground. And yes, you start pushing out your pipes to the outer edges of the borehole, there is a gain in performance. The question is, is it really at the end of the day more cost effective or equivalent performance? And I'll let the market decide that. So I think from a thermodynamic standpoint, um, yeah, it's it's pushing in the right direction. I just think you gotta do your homework, you gotta look at it from a pressure drop, from a Reynolds number, all that perspective, you gotta analyze your costs, and you gotta make the decision. Say yes, I saved money, or no, I didn't. Frankly, I don't wanna weigh in on that side of it. I'll let everybody sort of look at it individually. I don't think we need more data. We need to constantly look at better ways to do it. Then. I just would want to encourage this value added. I wish I had a nickel for kind of different design. That is geo bag. Huh? Ever heard of a geo bag? Geo bag developed by Harry Bro. 
at Louisiana State University, wonderful human being. He developed this polyethylene bag that's about three feet wide and about 40 feet long. And you buried it at the bottom of a three foot wide trench. And I loved it when Harry described it. He said, Yeah, we put it in there and we backfilled it and uh, the grass was growing. And I went out to walk on it. And I felt like I was walking on a water tank. And then he said, I'll redesign it. I'll weld it together in certain spots so it doesn't blow up like a pillow or a a water bed, so to speak, over inflated. And we were trying to minimize that effect. And at the end of the day, it was a product that simply wasn't going to add value. And there's spider bisect There's dozens of innovative ideas. I want to applaud them. But Let's run a through the battery test. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the, and the proof will be in the market. I think. I know Lloyd Bryan some in one of his prizes. I'm anxious to see how they perform. Um, let me give you a little history lesson, though. This one is kind of it. When you look at uh, how many are familiar with steel plates? Yeah, you push the pipes apart, the borehole, and remember when they appear. As a matter of fact, Jeff Fittler at OSU, who's a tremendous uh, academic, he developed a Glee Pro, which is the OSU design software, and he built a spreadsheet that would simply Move pipes farther apart. So you can calculate the equivalent single pipe diameter to then put into a software. And when I got that software, of course, I kicked the tires. I said, Damn, if I move my pipes apart, I get 15% gain in performance. This is great. So I'm sitting there trying to come up with the geo clip idea, and of course, I'm always a day late, a dollar short. I go to the Infa conference, and there's uh, uh, steel board technology, Rick Nash and company has their geo clip on their table. This is great. But as time evolved and people really started to look at them, it makes a fundamental flaw in assumption. And that is simply. A borehole with a conventional two pipe loop does not have two pipes side by side in the middle of the borehole. So, what is the base case? If I push that loop down the borehole, I got two coiled, they were coiled pipes with a lot of memory that are not going to simply be straight in a borehole. They're going to wander all over that borehole. Sometimes together, sometimes not. You're not going to take them together. The grout will tend to push them to the edge of the borehole anyway. So I really question when we get into the modeling and the validating of products that there may be a fundamental flaw in some of the assumptions we make there and there. And I really, I look at GeoClips, I thought it was a great idea when I first saw them. But when you're on a prevailing wage job and you're paying some guy $35 an hour to sit there and clip on clips every five to 10 feet, you could go to the cost of Was there really that 50% gain to begin with? 
or was this some delusion based on a poor assumption in running some modeling software? So that's what I, I want every new idea, every cockamamie idea to come out. And let's test it. So nothing against the Swiffers. I think Rob Jensen and company have done great work. I know the guys and uh, I applaud them. Go in with your eyes open. Who's up next? I second the motion. Oh, I got one. <laughs> yes, for those of you who need those wonderful PTA credits, make sure you sign the sheet that is somewhere. That is my assignment. Yes, that is the Not really, but I'm going <laughs> Not to be confused with sheet. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, drink up.